talk about the whole background of what made you want to do this project of getting music and graffiti linked up together and bringing it, uh, bringing it over to England with also the uh, breaking because they, they never had breaking in England before that did they? Well it didn't have it anywhere really it was a, it was a New York phenomenon that burst onto the scene um, that I had witnessed by going to a party in the Bronx one Saturday night. I was walking down the street in Harlem. It was in 1980. I had at that time been managing a group called Bow Wow Wow and they were to play the following night at the Roxy Club and I happened just to take a walk through Harlem and I was on 125th Street and I saw across the road, it was a bright sunny day a huge black guy, massive man but the most extraordinary thing about him was that he had a t-shirt on which said never mind the bollocks here's the sex pistols and I thought what's that big black guy in Harlem doing with a t-shirt like that so I had to cross the road and just confront him really and I said you know what that t-shirt represents you know and we started to talk and he finally turned around and said I love the sex pistols I said wow he said yeah and he said I didn't know you he said yeah I know your name but I've never met you before and I said well uh, he said why don't you come and see what we're doing I'm holding a party tonight in the South Bronx, he gave me this address and told me his name was Africa Bambata and I thought wow that's a fucking wild name and I was so curious I went and checked back in my hotel in Midtown Manhattan and tried to get a cab that evening it was impossible nobody wanted to go to this part of New York it was impossible. No cab would take me. I waited for a bloody hour and a half and finally I managed to persuade one cab driver but only on the basis that I kept all the windows shut and he advised me to put my money in my shoes and when I get out of the door to slam it quickly and forewarn me that there would be no way to get a cab like this back to Midtown Manhattan. You'd have to get a gypsy cab. Anyway, I thought he started to make me a little bit nervous, but I carried on the journey and I eventually arrived at the address. But the, the address was the address of a waste ground. There was no, I just thought it was a party in somebody's room, like a kind of shabeen or something, you know, a small sort of underground party. But no, it was this huge waste ground. Either side of this waste ground were two giant condominium blocks that were all burnt out. And this waste ground was just filled with black guys. And it was dark, there was no real street lights. So I was, to be frank, very nervous. But anyhow, I'd arrived, so I got out of the cab, slammed the guy's door shut, and started to walk into this huge throng of people. And uh, I thought, I'm the only white guy here. So I sort of tried to take on this attitude of being some kind of American A&R man from a big important record company and I waded my way through this crowd trying to part it like the waves, you know. And I, I, my, my whole destination was this light that I could see right at the very end which was a, sh a light of torches shining on what appeared to be a trestle table where there were banks of um, decks, record decks, and boxes of records. And behind this trestle table appeared this big black guy who I'd met earlier, Africa Bambata. I sort of got underneath the table to get on the other side because I thought, that's the safety area. <laughs> that's a protected zone. <laughs> and this guy, Africa Bambata, for all intents and purposes, turned out to be a kind of a bouncer, a guy who seemingly had a gang of kids. And he, this was his party, and he was protecting his equipment or whatever. And he was shining with a couple of his friends these large torches onto the decks where kids were acting almost like witch doctors. Uh, struggling with these decks, turning records around and using the needle like a guitar, you know, scratching certain grooves and spinning them back and forth and guys were sort of 
handing each other microphones and just suddenly stepping into the throng and starting to tell stories what ultimately I realized became known as rap. And then suddenly, inside this huge uh, throng of people, which was a, a very volatile kind of crowd that any moment would explode at some part, and uh, it would explode into what appeared to be guys who suddenly decided to dance on their head. I thought, this is extraordinary. I thought I was in darkest Africa. I thought this was extraordinary. This was like witch doctor stuff because the records that they seemingly were using were records that were records I'd heard in the past, old hits, they were like junk they were like old records from your brother's or your mother's cupboard, you know records by um, Diana Ross and the Supremes uh, Gary Newman's Cars um, uh, The Monkees and they seem to be able to mix all these records up and just use parts and elements of them and, and bounce one record against another and somehow out of this barrage of junk they were creating some other kind of music. In other words, making music out of other people's music by rapping on top of them and somehow joining it all together and meanwhile, ever so often, guys would just freak out and they would start bouncing on their heads and do the most incredible gymnastics. And there was some uh, very powerful feeling that I thought was very new. And as I looked around, I could notice that people had uh, spray cans and for some reason or another might be spraying, I don't know, a slogan. But it wasn't a slogan, it was really just a name. Dondi, uh, certain other names, and they would be doing this during the course of the whole evening, and they would be on walls of these condom, fired out condominiums, and again would be doing it with torches and uh, that, that were being held by various friends. So I seemingly come across this rather what I would describe as a kind of deconstructed. Um, sort of anti-consumerist, non-mainstream, very uh, ethnic and what I believed was a, a serious underground music that was against everything that existed because it was about um, uh, recycling. You could almost suggest it was ecological in that sense. <laughs> they were making music out of all this old, no one cared rubbish that had long gone, you know, disposable pop music. And they made sense of it all in some way. So I thought, I talked to Africa Bambada for a little while and I said, you know, I've got this group in town, they're from England. I'm having them play sort of African drums and they're doing a kind of music that you may be interested in but more importantly I would love you to come to their show and maybe support them put this on stage have you ever been to, to done a show in in New York in any way and of course no they never had and but they were keen and they would elect to do it so they arrived that Monday night at the backstage they couldn't get in there was a big kerfuffle at the door um, Finally, you know, because people thought they were like, I don't know, we're going to rip them off or blast their head off or whatever, or they were just trying to break in. But no, they were my support band, and I explained this, and finally got them in, and they mounted the stage. The most extraordinary thing was, though, of course, most of the audience were, I would say, white. Uh, there were record company executives, and everybody watched as this group was not a typical group. There were people with spray cans, guys had sort of giant boards were erected, a trestle table was erected, a group of kids came on stage, their baseball hats were turned round, they had graffiti across their t-shirts, they had a kind of a look that was totally different from anything anybody had genuinely witnessed before, particularly in what could be termed a typical New York rock venue. 
And then the most extraordinary thing, when they started up the music, which was again the same thing of recycling these old records, the guys in the front row of what Africa Bambata called his Zulu nation, suddenly jumped off the stage into this melting pot of white middle-class college kids uh, who just fled and, and just reeled backwards as these guys started to bounce on their heads. And um, I thought it was phenomenal. The executives fled upstairs to the balcony for safety, assumingly. And the night went on to the point where my group that I was managing, Bow Wow Wow, said, my God, Malcolm, how are we going to follow that? It was like too much. It was so extraordinary. And the following day, I went to RCA Records, which was the record company of Bow Wow, and said, you know, what you witnessed last night is going to explode. It's going to be a phenomenon beyond. You must try to sign this act if you really know what's good for you. I re highly recommend and was really trying to induce, seduce, <coughs> and inspire this A&R department to really take what they had seen that night before. Seriously. Anyway, they couldn't. They said, that's black music. You must go across the corridor. Malcolm, maybe to speak to the black department. So I wandered across the corridor. I never realized that record companies, even in those days, were still split between black and white music in New, in New York. So I wandered across to the black department. And the black department, of course, were only interested in George Benson and some other much more polite black music. This music they were not interested at all. This was a music that is made by people who might rape your mother or your daughter and no, we're not frankly interested. So that's where it was left. However, a year later, when I left Bow Wow Wow to make my own record, I decided that one of the major ports of call in making this record, which for me was a record that I wanted to go around the world and discover what I thought were more rootsy and more interesting forms of music because I felt that England at that time was not interesting for me musically and I thought there was more going on elsewhere, things that pop music hadn't really entered into, what you could now declare, which in those days didn't really exist, world music. And under that banner I set off on a journey which first took me to New York to really reignite my relationship with Africa Bambata and see what was going on. Lo and behold, a record was suddenly dominating the streets this summer, a year later, called Planet Rock. And there were kids on the streets, now break dancing with uh, caps to uh, take money from tourists or whoever in Midtown Manhattan. And they were kind of like uh, street buskers. They were like, they got a scene going. They thought they could make money from it by exhibiting these extraordinary movements. And graffiti seemed to appear everywhere. And more than that, it had now crept into the art galleries. Suddenly, these downtown art galleries had um, started to exhibit what I had seen briefly on the walls of this fired out condominium, what seemingly existed on the metro or the tube or whatever they called it, their underground uh, transport systems, um, was now being declared typical of the trendy New York art dealer, something very cool, very rootsy, very New York, very modern, very postmodern. Uh, and um, there were some white artists creeping up, the likes of Keith Haring, who suddenly had this enormous exhibition in a gallery that was run by a man who was ex-English Royal College of Art graduate called Tony Shrafratzi. And I wondered I would walk out, and if I'd be on the tube train or somewhere else, I would see the same graffiti on the walls. I thought it was extraordinary, it was just exploding at that point. Planet Rock was like the number one record in New York, Graffiti was all over the streets, kids were breakdancing, exhibiting themselves to tourists all over the place. And everybody seemed to be taking this upon themselves to think that it could be the next major popular cultural movement. And um, I suppose that at that point I really felt I would like to make a record because about that scene, the record Planet Rock, 
funnily enough, didn't really have any of what I had witnessed a year before with these DJs magically moving these decks around and what became later known as the technique of scratching. I wanted to put that on the record. I wanted to make that the main groove or texture or sound of the record. And um, I hunted around and I happened walking down Midtown Manhattan on 42nd Street to see two guys who were hustling, actually playing three-card Monty, trying to fleece tourists. And they were doing it, but at the same time they had this little beatbox nearby that were playing sort of um, what you might be describe as rap music, a very primitive early form of it. Um, this hip-hop music I suddenly located and assumed it was theirs. So I struck up a conversation with them and I said, what are you doing playing three card money? And he said, well, we're getting, trying to get money together because if we get maybe $400, we can go down to this radio station, a small private radio station somewhere in uptown Manhattan. And if they put this money down, they could take a half an hour of airtime. It was one of these typical New York radio stations, which was like a an ethnic radio station where there would be one hour of Albanian poetry, uh, one hour of Muslim teachings, one hour of uh, Hungarian literature, for all the disparate ethnic elements of New York. And they had naturally, being Muslims, had declared themselves they wanted to take a Muslim half an hour. But this half an hour was a kind of party half an hour where they would take calls on the phone and they would spin records and they would rap over records a little bit and they called themselves the world's famous supreme team show and i took those guys and wanted to make a record of the things that i had seen incorporating not only this scratching technique but also the general ambience of what i felt was like one of the major postmodern real pop movements that i hadn't really experienced as powerful before. Perhaps the last inclination of that was punk rock, where we would cut up letters, stick them onto boards, and create another, what you might call, uncommercial, um, deconstructed, uh, therefore underground, slightly subversive form of uh, lettering such as what became known as Kidnap Ransom, that kind of thing. And punk rock had a similar kind of Luddite attitude. It was also anti-consumerist. It was also coming out of a, an attack against an established viewpoint of the culture, which had by then, for all intents and purposes, become very homogenized and ruled by accountants and so on. So I saw this as a black form of punk rock, really. And... Um, I liked it for all those things. It was a very do-it-yourself type of activity and uh, it required a kind of bravery and it required a sort of desperation and a kind of natural sense of um, how to reuse the music and turn it on its head into something else. I loved all that aspect of it and in those days sampling and scratching other people's records the record industry didn't even know what was going on and could not police it as they do today. So I made a record called Buffalo Girls and when I came to make the video I wanted obviously to incorporate all the ambience of that New York scene that I had witnessed a year before and had witnessed at that time. So I contacted Don D. White I think that was his name anyway and had him do a whole graffiti of the name of the record, Buffalo Gals, and shot that in New York and shot some of the kids who had certain special movements inside clubs out on the street to then basically export such, uh, um, uh, such an expression, visual expression, across the world. And I suppose when it came to London, it was kind of like, whoa, what is this? How do you dance? Like the whole notion of the sound, the idea of scratching, it intrigued everybody and exploded through that record across the rest of the world as far as New Zealand, where Maoris, the ethnic, perhaps 
more maligned at that time group of people in New Zealand took up hip hop as did the aborigines in Australia as did all other more disenfranchised elements in Germany and in France, the black, the North Africans in Paris and so on and this record was like a real stepping stone for all those ethnic groups to suddenly come out of the closet to come out of the ghetto suddenly there was, this was a music they could identify with and had the power that they could understand far more than punk rock because I think it was coming from a more groove oriented and it had a much more modern feeling it wasn't as romantic as punk rock it was at, but it, and it was more um, uh, less guitar driven and therefore more uh, it had more the feeling that you really um, could suggest was of its time. Punk rock was very much the end of the past. This seemed to be very much about future and it went hand in hand with the names of the groups and particularly the graffiti artists like Futura 2000 and so on. And The graffiti side of it and the visual expression of it seemed to me to be one which um, unless sustained by um, the hip-hop movement it would either die within the trendy um, galleries of New York who would suddenly feel as they did several years later that this kind of art was one which was not going to develop into the frame that they could sell it as and would not necessarily even develop in the way they wanted it to develop. That that they couldn't, they couldn't basically talk to these people. It was as simple as that. It was two planets colliding, and so they naturally had to die in that area. And the hip hop movement, very concerned with grabbing whatever from their success, the elements of what seemed to be. New York's important uh, status symbols sort of left graffiti behind because it was associated with the street side of things that they were less and less interested in. Then they were, wanted to wrap themselves in gold. Graffiti didn't really make them feel that, that, that it made them too conscious of the ghetto when in some respects they wanted to be out of the ghetto. So I think graffiti suffered as an art form in that respect. Although Keith Haring came to the fore and another strange, uh, weird white artist called Richard Hambledon who would paint these mad, huge, splashed black ghost figures that any time you took a pee on the sidewalk after leaving or exiting one of these shabines or clubs, you'd suddenly be confronted by this mad figure and you say, oh my god, it's another Richard Hamilton. You suddenly thought, he painted them in such a way you thought they were major, you know, just like shadows of someone about to just grab you. And uh, that became a very major look across uh, New York too and totally different, more uh, splash-like, um, less um, drawn uh, as uh, was um, Keith Haring's, which was more calligraphic. Um, and the, the black artists, uh, Dondi, Futura, and there were many, many others, um, I think suffered uh, ultimately because they couldn't find a way to... Um, they didn't have they couldn't find a way to um, control, grab, uh, work within that art community and the music community ultimately run very much by the powers of uh, distribution, the major conglomerates really didn't want that association, you know and later on New York was cleaned up and graffiti was rubbed off the trains, the walls and everything else and it became more a memory, I suppose. So that's my story. That's brilliant because that's like everything is uh, you got you covered everything. I just wanted to ask you how do you how do you think they came together the graffiti 
and the music. Why do you think they were doing them both? Well, it was all very much... Um, I suppose if you, you have to look at it and think that it was... It was a scene that really developed out of the wastelands of New York. And if you are going to sort of make your mark in any way within the context of that wasteland or what you might believe are carriers of your mark, i.e. the tubes, then the music was the same. It was like out of the wasteland of old records. The notion of dance music had become already by then an underground and more... Um, more outsider's way of creating music. The DJ was there already becoming a prominent feature and the DJ often needed his decks decorated. He needed his large stacks decorated. And they loved, these people, feeling insecure, not wanting always or willing to step out of the South Bronx. Naturally, when they had to start working and moving their equipment to downtown and other other uh, clubs being hired for the night, they loved to wander in gangs, in crews. They didn't want to go alone. So these sort of crews, posses, started to develop nations, as Bambata called his crew, the Zulu nation. And everybody had to have a job of some sort. They kind of taught, sort of took upon themselves to be some sort of mini army. You know, you're be the guy who does the decks and the DJ, you're the guy that does the rapping, you're the guy who's the decorator, you're the guy who's looking after, watching out and is the bouncer, and you two guys are going to do some break dancing and so on. So that's how these crews developed. And it was much better to run in a pack as they'd been taught in the, in the wastelands as gangs which is where they all originated from, gangs on the streets. Bambada was a gang star, you know, either selling dope or whatever in the beginning. Um, they developed these gang-like attitudes when it came to making music and whatever else could envelop their scene, could give them all their marks, their signatures, their, their signs. This was their whole world. This is what they had created. It was a complete statement. And that's why today you still have, if you like, uh, even in the wilds of Tottenham here, massive crews, Brixton posses, and so on. It's, it's the continual uh, idea that hip-hop and graffiti started in New York became global because the idea of rock and roll or music being something you disassociate yourself from when you're standing watching a group. This was coming out of a dance club scene where everybody far more interacted and, um, and it, was, it was on the street. It wasn't something you created in the, the confines maybe of your bedroom in that regard. So you, 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 you had these gang-like feelings and you felt more powerful, I suppose, running in a pack. And that's how I think that everybody ended up combining it all. And it still is today, you know, whether you look at the drum and bass and jungle scenes, although they don't have maybe, at the moment, such an obvious graffiti, the graffiti today is not so much drawn, it's digitalized through TV, and through the use of, um, uh, uh, of software. And what you have now is that software is more cool for them because if they, they, they can now use a hand and the hand, just by virtue of, um, uh, 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 of coding with the image, they can change the image. Or they can go whoop and the image can uh, move accordingly through audio. So they've moved on. And that's what you'll see, I think, in the next year already is happening now, these other kind of elements where you've got the visual side of the DJ as well as the oral side. That's brilliant, thanks. That's uh, exactly what you're saying now, that's, uh, you can cut it, thanks. Yeah. Yeah, cut it.
That's exactly what Futura is doing now. Mm. So he's into to, oh, probably yeah. digital stuff. Exactly yeah. what you said. Yeah, that's where it's at. Uh, because it's more, you know, then you could got your big screen, you project it all on the screen, and the screen's forever changing. So unlike doing a piece of graffiti that stays and it's motionless, mm. now you have a screen, so and it's constantly interactive. And interactive, although the, the, the establishment aren't able to still yet quite understand it, it's the street that's understanding it a lot more and are able to use it in a very simplistic but uh, very real way. And they will be the people that will break through that whole interactive thing. They will make it the most sexy. Oh, yeah. You know, it won't be as cerebral as the likes of Peter Gabriel and mm. Eno and all that. It's, it's oh, yeah, well, there you go. You see, they're already emailing and... Yeah, and it's like he's connected to this Here's the address thing. of my site. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. They connect to the web, and that's where it's all going. And, you know, web TV, underground, downloading music, graphics and so on is definitely the future it's, it's definitely where it's going to go and you know the, 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 these guys are sort of basically on the verge of suggesting in a few years to come that you won't purchase your music from shops so much mm. or your cultural information in that way it's going to come through tv and it's going to come through the net and the net is only well, it's only getting more, it's only about buying the technology. Oh, yeah. Once you've got a transponder and this, that and the other, you can you sort of broadcast it. from your goddamn bedroom across yeah. the planet. It's not a half going to be a hassle. And I think the reason why the industry is sort of holding back is because they know that, that it's only a question of the technology being affordable yeah. or someone being able to thieve it or somehow or another grabbing it that that's what will happen and that's where these guys will come back and have a renaissance it's amazing this whole uh, the whole film that I'm doing is all because um, I just heard on the news a couple of months ago that this uh, graffiti writer from um, Sheffield he got put in prison for five years right that's a lot bit harsh. Absolutely, you know? yeah. And so uh, I started like researching into it. I found the guy's mother, I went to interview her, we started doing this whole thing about graffiti and I didn't realise like how big it is. It's a culture. Yeah, oh yeah, major you know, culture. And that's what you were saying. Is you're the and first it's developed, to, really developed. Yeah, to also highly developed now. Where it's because it's also, signs, like it's all started about roots and signs and connecting signs. It's new language where all these kids don't read. They just deal in fragments and signs. Wow. It's semiotics, yeah. but it's of a new kind. Whereas through postmodernist thinking and philosophy, that's the, 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 the white philosophers are kind of die because they feel nobody cares. But under the carpet, there's this kind of underground wasteland that they haven't really penetrated that actually are caring more than they ever thought and are developing a whole nation of sign language wow. that will be a new grammar and the way videos and all the visualization of music will happen will be with this new <coughs> grammar non-narrative on the level of train spotting is once at a level in terms of filmmaking but on the level of the visualization of music it will also create an even more non-narrative but definitely a new kind of grammar through the use of signs and vibrations and things that work and what may be difficult for people now to understand, well, I don't understand it, it's just a few green blobs. But these guys know that those green blobs in a few years are going to mean something. Oh, yeah. Nobody quite knows what they mean at the moment, <laughs> but they're going to mean oh, something. Yeah. And it's a strange thing and they're very into it because it has these mesmeric trance-like effects and it takes them into it. And it's combined very much with the drug culture as well and it's all part and parcel that's why people like trains but because it glamorized drugs for the first time because people are quite open about glamorizing drugs simply because it is part of an underground culture that people do feel it's one way out of a system and it's another way of creating perhaps by getting seduced into taking certain drugs another language you know it's it's not like the 60s because it's very much, um, I suppose the best way to describe it, it's, it's nihilism as was certain rebellious elements and always in the 60s was nihilism but it's more designer nihilism and therefore it's a nihilism about, more, about product. It has less compassion 
They don't feel that because they don't want to get involved in the notions of melodrama. That's old school. So they don't want lyrics that suggest any kind of melodrama. That's old school. It's down to simple signs. It's, it's maybe on first looking um, uh, almost uh, uh, cold in a way. But it's, it's a reaction against what's happening in the world. And it, that, that they, that they are, are, are looking at the world as a place that is devoid of a point of view. You don't know who the enemy is anymore. Therefore, the, it, it, it's kind of gone in on itself and they've created a kind of a, um, a language that is not easy to penetrate for those very reasons. Mm. It's a bit like going back to Africa and the white man trying to figure out where the one is in the beat, but he can't find it. And the reason he can't find it is because they purposely created the music like that so nobody could steal it. You know. It's and it's the same trip. Yeah. But it's, it, it's not necessarily that conscious, but it's there, for sure. Did you think it would have this kind of impact? Um, I don't know. I think at the time, in 1980, I was very conscious that music was going to break open. That out of the traditional formats that we'd heard since the days of the 60s, the format of the pop song had already become political as from the 50s where they were still singing about love under the silvery moon you had the Bob Dylans and people were already embarking on folkloric lyrics and things and everybody was looking for a point of view and you created that point of view but the format was beginning to get jaded and it's beginning to get co-opted and they were beginning to get very aristocratic and then you had the breakdown nihilistic punk rock movement which was Luddite, it was anti-consumerist, anti-fashion, anti-music, anti-everything. And then that was swept away and back came the pragmatic industry to turn it into new way. And now what you've got is it went swept, the, the, the underground swept into the dance scene where making music was nothing. Everybody could make music. Technology was here, it was no bigger. So dance music was able to sort of saturate uh, the world with music that wasn't necessarily co-opted by the traditions of an industry kind of get, getting everybody into making songs and behaving like good little pop groups. That changed and out of that dance scene it tended to bring together a lot of disparate people from many different uh, walks and ways and attitudes of music and you know there's no musical language in pop culture today that has more genres than dance music. Techno, house, happy house, hip-hop, acid jazz, rave, jungle, drum and bass, you know. People sort of only just now discovering drum and bass and they don't realize that drum and bass is white. Drum and bass is the techno boys getting very interested like surgeons into sort of creating these beats with a slow funky bass line but it's more uh, easy listening it's more to sit at home it's more to um, if you like uh, be philosophical with uh, be spiritual with jungle which the white guys thought was a derogatory term because black people would think it raises is bollocks jungle is what black people think the music is because their attitude to drum and bass is Fucking get the loops, forget the surgeon element because they want to get up and party. So they, it's back to the grabbing hold of the mic and just rapping over these beats that they come along with every Saturday night to their local Shabin and they cut and manipulate up on, with a DJ and the guy's there as the MC. And the worse the speakers are, and it's always interesting in ethnic communities or, or, or underground communities like that, that their equipment is always going to be inferior to the more white, more surgeon-like, more middle-class kind of musical guys. And so their speakers are more dilapidated. So the bass is going to be sound very distorted because they want it pumped up so you can really feel it. So unless the speakers are really crappy, so, that, so the bass starts flapping and cutting out, it doesn't happen. It's all the cutting out and the flappy and the crappy part of it is what makes jungle for them. That's why they think that's jungle. That's kind of wild. 
and uh, they love that and they get down on that and dance on the off beats whereas everybody else in the white city are trying to dance on the one it's a different scene and the industry today if you look at it now with their sort of enthusiasm so called for drum and bass it's because their enthusiasm is for this kind of quiet kind of more silky sort of laid back and of course that's they think they can sell because they don't they wouldn't even wander into these shit. They don't know. This is another world they don't want to be associated with. This is jungle. Ju we don't to talk about jungle. Drum and bass. So you'll see all these magazines doing wonderful articles on drum and bass. Because it all sounds more polite. <laughs> it all sounds That's all. That's the only reason. And it's a complete uh, 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 propaganda, you know, mm. to, to, to dismiss the word jungle. Because it suddenly conjures up something that they don't necessarily want to deal with. So, you know, it's the same sit, the same trip. And uh, I don't know if it will marry, it may come out. England has a worse record for racist music and um, they... I, and I suspect it's simply because of um, population but, and it's due to the kind of uh, traditions of class structure here but um, because in America anything that sells is cool, you know, it's a bit more egalitarian in that respect. Here, that's why they're not pushing jungle. They'll push drum and bass because they want jungle to become polite and therefore easy to deal with. Therefore, it can right. lay very nicely amongst the racks in Tower and Virgin. That's like Goldie's <coughs> bigger in the States than he is here. Yes, and Goldie's more of a Milli Vanilli, let me tell you, <laughs> of that scene. I have been there. He's very Milly Vanilli. He is not uh, what these guys are. The, the guys that deal in jungle are very heavy, very from... serious. They are crack dealers. They are mm. wild. They are pistol carrying guys. They're part of an underground that's very heavy and almost not even penetrable to the white man today, right here in London. And it's, it, it, it's a, a political thing in that respect, but unconscious, because they don't overtly declare lyrics that would parade such intentions but it's it it's their frenzy it's their uh, their power it's their machismo you know and the, you know their icons are james bond things yeah. we would consider naff today totally <laughs> politically incorrect but for them you've sold them james bond for 20 years they've just bought into it and they think <laughs> yeah we want a bit of james bond you know if we drive up in our bmw it's got to be black it's got to be like the Bond car, and that we got to wear those Gucci glasses. Unlike the drum and bass guys, if you see, they're not into that at all. They don't want any gold or Gucci glasses, and they don't drive BMWs, and they don't pump the bass. Out. That's the difference. If you look at the white drum and bass guys, they're all into a far more, uh, you know, uh, British telecom trouser look, uh, <laughs> military cool but cool, you know. It's a different thing, and no status, no labels on their body. Uh, they're, they're, they're more nihilistic in that way. But it's just like the hip-hop thing. But the jungle guys, you know, you see them, they're Gucci glasses, Versace trousers, oh, yeah. pistol packing, crack alley, tough, hardcore. And the dry bass has got to be splattering like a fucking machine gun all over the place. But you said it's the hip hop of the 90s. The oh, is no question in this town because what they couldn't do here, and it's due to the the, the um, it's due to the breakdown of uh, the black population here. They were not able to develop a language strong enough. The language comes out of Jamaica, and it's very dancehall, and they have a certain attitude, but. It, it wasn't powerful enough, and I think in England it was resisted much, much more than hip-hop was in America. America is a more musical nation generally. They need music more than we do, and they, they travel longer distances. They've got to have in their cars. There's a whole thing about why music takes off in America. When they start something, they really start something. Here they start something. It tends to usually only be transported anywhere if it's white. You don't find black music in England being transported that much. Little kind of crews are on the more sophisticated side of things like Massive Attack. Yeah. Yes, little more things like um, Soul to Soul, um, the odd dance group or Soul Singer. But it's, it, there's no big movement. Yeah. It's not like hip-hop. 
The movement is jungle. Because the movement before was yeah. dancehall and ragga, and before that it was reggae and ska. Yeah. But if you look at all those movements, they never really broke through worldwide, and you have to answer the question why. And the reason why is because I think the industry here has never really allowed it to happen. They've never really sponsored it, they've never really backed it. The people sitting in A&R departments don't understand it. Wouldn't fucking dream of going down to Peckham at 11 o'clock at night and <laughs> <laughs> walking into one of those shabines. It wouldn't get them fucking two miles near that place. You know what I mean? Yeah. So it's not going to happen. Not to say that the New Yorkers do, but they're, 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 they're smarter. They hire guys who will do that because they want to sell white music, black music, any kind of color music as long as it sells. Mm. And it's a different attitude, so they'll get in there if that's what's happening. Yeah. Here, they, won't, they don't care if it sells. They don't want to go there. And that's what I think stops a lot of black music happening here. Yeah. That's interesting. Because 3D from Massive Attack, he comes from hip-hop and graffiti. Absolutely. You know, he still does it. Oh, absolutely. The, there, there will be the odd groups like that, and they're brilliant and they're very oh, yeah. talented people. But... Um, I think they don't go really appreciated and they're not really supported and it's because they're run by a white record company who don't really quite know and they're looking for the odd single and as soon as the odd single comes out they want to immediately take the girl who sang it and put yeah. her in another con. Mm. Always deconstructing it so the crews never grow strong. They're always weak because they keep pruning all the fucking time. Crazy. It's a it's a it's a, a phenomenon that people have no right about in England, but it really does exist in the music industry big time, yeah. and uh, it's a real real problem. They because people in the music industry don't really understand music. They don't really like music very much. To be no, they're not. Friends. They're not into. I find they're it not really, really weird. Into the record it, companies no. that you deal with, and we called Virgin now. To so ask them about the clip, if we could use the clip in the film. Yeah, they probably said, oh, we don't know if we've got it, we can't be bothered. No, they said to us, we're sorry, it's past five years, so um, if you want it, you have to pay £250 a head to everybody that participated in the film. There you go, you see that? Now, that's all bollocks. They just it say that because they don't want yeah. it. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I'm sure that even if I did, like, start locating... Well, we've DJs. got it at our office, it's there, so you can have it. I just have to just run off and copy. What I did, don't have, is probably a very, very good copy of it. That's all right. Do you see what I mean? I have a, you know, probably a third or fourth generation. That's, that's the trouble. Cool. It's not brilliant to yeah. look at, but maybe it doesn't matter for this purpose. Well, that's all right. It's purely an illustration. Because they wouldn't go suing us, would they, Virgin? They wouldn't give a fuck. They wouldn't give a fuck. No, they can't be bothered. They did, that, 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 that's the nature of the business yeah. here. What are they doing, the world famous Supreme? They came here after they got a success and of course the English immediately saw this hip-hop thing and thought, oh, we'll sign this American band and sell them back to America. And of course the world famous with Dream Team, being such gangsters as they were, came in, took the advance, and what the English didn't understand is <laughs> didn't they got on the fucking next plane back home and they've never been seen again since. Oh, brilliant. That, that that's brilliant. what happened to the world famous Supreme Team. And they, last time I heard, they were giving part, that they became the party guys for the LA Raiders. They put on parties. That was about five, six, maybe seven years ago. Yeah, and I haven't heard of them since then. Wow. You know, there's hundreds of guys like that. I just oh, happened yeah. to bump into those That's guys. Because I mean, look, look what Futura's doing today. He's doing all this kind of stuff from Oax. He's doing all their... Uh, who is this? Sorry, I'm sorry. That's, um, DJ Crush. Yeah, that's all Futura's covers. Right. That's and what he's doing now, Futura 2000. Right. It's just kind of new, right. new wave graffiti. Yeah. Much more... He was always going this way, even when he was in the graffiti scene in the 80s. He was very different from the other artists. Was he very wild when you met him at the beginning? Because he's very kind of... Like a father figure now, isn't he? Yeah. No, he was very wild, but he, and he was very successful in the beginning. But I don't, you know, he signed to a gallery, and I think they didn't ha they couldn't handle it. They couldn't handle it because as soon as the ghetto broke open with the success of hip hop, you know, it was like all these black kids were suddenly descending downtown, buying Gucci and glass and gold, and they couldn't handle it. I think that's what it was, and. It, it, it obviously continued and continued and continued and turned into one of the biggest parts of the music industry in America over the past 10 years, but um, 
that, that they that, that they didn't like it. They didn't like it, and they still don't. They don't like rap music, American record industry people, but they do it because it sells. It sells. Yeah. Mm. I think they're that, afraid of it. I mean, the white people are afraid of it. They it's are the really. The white middle class college kids loves it because it has a sign of power, and it's yeah. it's heavily misogynistic in in part. Well, so it's liked for all those reasons. That's like they had Marky Mark. And it's like because your parents don't like it. Yeah, it's not exactly. any more complicated than that too. You know, if you're living in the middle of Missouri, you know, and you're playing Snoopy Doggy Dog, you know your parents aren't going to like it. Yeah, so that's part of it. So Minnesota. Mm -hmm. You see that film Fargo? No, I haven't seen that yet. No. No, really weird. Really. I grew up there in the Midwest, Minnesota. And you should see, you know, I don't know if you've surfed the net in times, but you'll see a lot of graffiti happening. Yeah, happening on, on the net. Oh yeah, but yeah, yeah transporting messages, and, and sometimes it's just digitalized uh, graphics, you know. But it's it, it's part of that graffiti. Because I know there's an exhibition in August. There's a big graffiti festival. In London, in if you look at the Huxley. Chapman brothers, for instance, oh, yeah. who are kind of designer nihilist sculptors, part yeah. of a whole new generation post Damien Hirst, yeah. if you really look at their work, you'll see that it's not that far a stretch to consider that's not part of and come out of a kind of graffiti sensibility where you are taking shit off the streets and you are sticking it together oh, to make right. some big statement, nihilistic statement. You know, mannequins that yeah. are really that are deconstructed and reworked. Yeah. I mean, it's not far fetched. And if you look at all the artists that encircle them, real artists, like go to the Carsten Schubert Gallery right now, and you'll see all the young Turks there that, you know, are together in a joint show, all kind of have this element of designer nihilist graffiti. It's, it's part of their way of doing things because their work is becoming a uh, sign language and it's becoming um, more disposable it's um, and a very important thing and this is one of the major differences actually today with that whole scene is that it's about not being unique if you can be reproduced <laughs> then you are cool if you can't really? it's not cool yeah the idea of being unique is the anti-art uh, thing that's going down now. <laughs> and that may be, it's a le you know, it's, you go back to Andy Warhol and the reproducibles, it's happening here. I mean, that was the whole idea of Damien Hirst with the Dulux color circles. But now it's in a much more, less pretty scene, you know. These guys make Damien Hirst look pretty in comparison. <laughs> And they're real night designer nihilists, you know, and they're artists, and that's where it's at. And it's in whether they embark and use film or digitalize technology to create um, uh, visuals, or whether they just take, you know, for instance, you know, they'll take, say, a blood splat, but instead of it seeping into the canvas, it will be congealed and plasticized. That's the difference. It's that coldness. And there's a difference. And that's yeah. the vibe now. So it's quite about removing passion mm -hmm. and having a certain anonymity that is equally repro re reproducible. It's the reason why people are wearing uniforms. Yeah. It's in order to, 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 to um, disassociate yourself from this fashion mainstream and art has become fashion as fashion has become art everything is joining yeah, yeah joining and so you know the music scene the art scene the graffiti scene the the underground visual technology should be everything is all part of it you know it's why the why the booze factories are, are, are so desperate to get in because they blew out booze booze was too much about labels yeah. So they had to create a drink where they could just say, it's just got alcohol in it, you know, yeah. subs and, and all these concoctions. It's all about trying to get to this new market because oh, they're losing so much yeah. money by not being able to sell liquor to these guys because they don't drink vodka. They don't drink vodka. So it has to do with some older generation thing. Yeah. Yeah. They just want alcohol, that's all we understand. What does it do? It makes you fucking do that. 
So that's it. So, you know, there you've got a transparent white drink that's virtually like water, but it's got alcohol injected in it, and they prefer to buy it like that. It's a very interesting, interesting thing, and it's all part of the same uh, psychology. Yeah. Well, it's not under Fosters. That's why Fosters, are, you know, they're doing all these big graffiti gigs. Absolutely. Loads of them. They brought Absolutely. Peter Absolutely. over. And oh, yeah, the booze companies are the ones that are desperate right now. Right. Desperate. Really interesting, oh, isn't it? Amazing, yeah. Desperate to get in because, do you realise, the rave industry, that is, raves, everything, oh, yeah. you know, everything is a rave. Every club is a rave now. That's a ubiquitous word. Mm. Yeah is worth over two billion pounds a year in this country alone. And in those raves, where they, when they began, they didn't sell alcohol. No. They sold E, they took yeah. tabs, they had water, they had guarana drinks. Yeah. So the fucking booze industry was losing millions. So these guys wouldn't dare tread into a pub. No. They, first of all, they don't like the carpets, and secondly, the music's naff. They wouldn't go in these places. So. The pubs were losing, losing, losing. All they could do with the pubs was chintz them up more, make them wine bar mm -hmm. serve yeah. food, get a French chef in. <laughs> but they were just appealing to a smaller and sure. smaller yeah. group of people. Meanwhile, this new generation was leaving in droves, that scene. So you've got now a situation in which the pubs are having trouble. In turn, the breweries are now having trouble. So they decided, what could they do? They've got to get into where all these kids go, which are these giant warehouses, these huge shabines. How can they get them back into drinking booze? That's the biggest problem they're having. That's why you've got all these new drinks happening. They're going to put vodka into Garana, yeah. give it a new name, sell it as an alcohol drink. Garana Vod, you know, whatever it would be is what's happening now in order to get back in on the scene which they're losing millions because years ago you go to a rock and roll gig and you buy a pint of lager that doesn't exist anymore because these kids they don't go to that many rock and roll gigs but they certainly are partying and raving every weekend and they're not buying the traditional booze it doesn't exist not on the bar tab yeah so you know it's amazing yeah the whole Isn't industry everything's changing, well, everything really is changing fast. so yeah. fast we're entering a whole nother world now and you know, Channel 4, in about three months' time, you know, they, 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 they've got to fill their space. Every, every TV company's got to fill their space 24 hours. So that they're thinking of making programs now. They're giving it to all these digitalized kids who are making digitalized videos. So you say, you know, you've got 50, we want, we'll buy a program for 15 grand, one hour, because that's yeah. all we can pay for two to three. Well, of course, they know the only people watching TV at that hour are kids coming back from raves. Yeah. So, therefore, they need rave-induced visuals. <laughs> so, they want to buy this kind of digitalized visual, put on some drum and bass, scribble at the bottom what the record is for those kids to know, perhaps, and that's it. And it will just be blobs and blimps and all kinds of digitalized... Uh, graffiti on the screen. Yeah. You will see that in forms of programs on network television in about three to four to six months time now. I know because I know yeah. the mandate and I know guys out there making these digitalized things are being constantly approached for that purpose. So there you go. And that's really to appeal to a generation yeah. that's dropped out. Yeah. And they don't know, the, the industry doesn't know how to get in there because the youth driven market is enormous. But they've lost it. And the record industry, by repackaging all the old music and constantly foddering it out into the A to Z Remasters. museums of, of, of Tower and Virgin, they can't figure out how to get into this scene. They're too scared, they're too old, they don't know. Yeah. They're lost. They are lost in that whole scene. Lost. They seem desperate though, they're so remastered. You know, there's, every month there's a new... That today, what is it? They said today, Dire Straits remastered. And so everything they do is remastered, and they're not making new stuff. No, no because really they're really selling really to recycled. a smaller and smaller market, who have got maybe more and more money, and are building their CD collection as before they built their LP collection. They're yeah. buying the same records yeah. over and over yeah. again. So they're selling to a kind of, di and that's a crowd that's getting older. It's not sure. getting younger. But the young audience is is far apart, they can't penetrate it, they're, and they can't deal with them, they can't hype them. 
They'll post to the fucking streets, but they can't hide them. It's just not happening. Only on the level of young girls can they still get to with the idea you know, of the pop groups, i.e. the boy bands, the Oasis, the Blurs, yeah. and things like that. Yeah. That's about it. But the true progression in music is, is all that other more digitalized, much more nihilistic musical scene that is happening within the context of the dance and rave clubs. That they don't seem to be able to penetrate at all. They don't understand it. And yet it's building colossal now. Yeah. And you know, it'll be maybe TV before it's the record industry. So it's existing outside of, um, of record companies full stop? It's existing because these kids just, just press like 12 inch vinyls, they press a thousand, they, they get them out, they sell them at the raves. DJs have got yeah. a bit of, you know, bag under their table, kid comes in, what is that? Sell it like that. It's all done on a very shoestring affair. And, um, so it's sort of all independent. Uh, yeah, and then it's spread. Then there'll be a one-stop distributor in Holland or want to take a thousand for the rave kids over there. And then there's a one-stop in Germany and a one-stop in Paris, Madrid, Milan. And these DJs travel. Mm. They all interact. Mm. They're going from a rave in Milan to a rave in Ibiza to a rave in London to or Edinburgh to and so on. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, Even as far as India. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. It's a whole other, other world. Yeah. It's credible, don't you think? Yeah. I think it's uh, fascinating. Yeah. It's fascinating. And, and what's interesting, actually, in the music is it's uh, become much more egalitarian because of it all. Yeah. That's the most interesting thing. That's what's happened. We've actually bought an aspect of America that actually um, one never thought they w people would buy into, but we're actually slowly... But we bought into that side of it. It's, it, it, it's the passionless, it's hard, it's all the things that happened in the 80s, the money orientation, uh, everything's a product, there's no ideology, no philosophy, no point of view, right. it's just a buck. And this is the reaction. This is it. This is what you're getting. This is the, you know, how the culture is now reinterpreting from that, what it's doing with it. Mm. And it's totally different from any other era. We've yeah. never had this before. And, it, and, so it's, it's, a major and it's with technology. Yeah. It's technology driven. That's that's been the opening, you know, you know, from the days of the computer hacker now to kids sitting at home, digitalizing yeah. programs, wanting more and more technology so they can broadcast themselves. Mm. They don't they don't that's what they want to do over the net. Yeah. <laughs> it's yeah. amazing.